Do you buy into Velikovsky's theories then? That is, I guess this is similar to Velikovsky's stuff? Yes, it is. Uh, Velikovsky was on the right track. Yeah. Uh, I don't really think that that Venus was created out of Jupiter, that it was an explosion out of Jupiter that, mm-hmm. that made, made, made a planet. I don't, I just, I don't, I don't like that very much. Uh, how, however, are you still there? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here. Okay. I, I heard something in, in my headset that was strange. Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, but Venus is peculiar because Venus is supposed to be Earth's twin. Right. But it's so hot on Venus. I believe the Russians landed a a uh, a, a ship there to, mm-hmm. to try and take some readings. Of, uh, I don't know, probably a decade or so ago. And the the vehicle only lasted for about uh, three minutes because it's so hot on Venus uh, yeah. that, that 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 the spaceship just melted. So why Venus is so hot? No one really knows. Mm. So, so I think Velikovsky had the right ideal. I don't buy into all of his details, but he definitely had the right idea. Sure, sure. You know, uh, Edward, we're just coming up to the top of the first hour, um, and we'll continue on again. But I do want to mention uh, your conference. Uh, of course, people can find you on the Inner Traditions uh, publishing website, um, uh, as all the artists we do in the show. And uh um, Ancient Mysteries International are doing a conference at Serpent Mound. Is that correct? That's correct. At, at uh, Serpent Mound in Ohio. That'll be in June. And they're doing another one in August at uh, the Cahokia Mounds near Collinsville, Illinois. Wow. And you'll find that on Ancient Mysteries International. Uh, you've got, got a, a wealth of people there. I think you've got Ross Hamilton, Gary David. Gar- Gary's been on the show. Great guy, Gary David. Uh, David David Hatcher Childress as well. So That's correct. He's going to be the keynote speaker at the Serpent Mound Conference. Wow. So that's June 21st. And, uh, you know, if anybody wants to go along to that, we've got a big listener base in America. Get out there to uh, what a beautiful setting, Serpent Mound. I've always wanted to go. I think it's a fascinating place. Um. You know, uh, thing for me, Edward, is uh, obviously, uh, as you talk about in the book as well, the role of symbol and symbology and stuff. This is a core part of us today, um, as well as it is in ancient times, right through. We've always had symbology. It's always been symbol and symbology. Let's talk a bit about that, Edward. Well, language is simple, it's plain and simple. Mm. Uh, so, so some people think that we invented language so we could lie to each other, which seems to be the case this day. <laughs> but, but, but symbolism is the heart of any language, whether it's scientific or not. And when you look at, at ancient Egypt, the first look at, at ancient Egypt some 100 years ago, or maybe a little bit more than 100 years ago, well, we have to remember that at the late 19th century, early 20th century, Europe and America was still very Christian Bible oriented. Okay, Now, I'm not saying every single person was a Christian and went to church. What I'm saying is that our culture and the state of mind of the people was to look at belief patterns in a modern way then at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. So when they started looking at ancient Egypt, they automatically uh, superimposed their ideas of religion into the ancient past and came up with the concept that the ancient Egyptians had to be nature worshippers, animal worshippers, because all of their 200 gods had something to do with animals. Okay? And that that nut was cracked pretty hard by a man by the name of René Schwar de Lubitz. Uh, He was a Frenchman born in in 1877. He Mm -hmm. passed away in 1961. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he spent a full decade uh, in uh, in ancient Thebes, modern day Luxor, mm-hmm. and, and then why he did so it was 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 actually just a situation at the times. He was living in France, and uh, in 1939, uh, the, the Second World War started, and it became very apparent to him that Germany was going to cause Europe a lot of problems. So he and his wife in 1939 left France and moved to Luxor. 
and there he hooked he hooked up with an an, uh, an archaeology friend and decided to spend the next decade uh, trying to unravel what the ancient Egyptian culture was all about. And here I'm talking about the Temple of Amun, or to be more technical, the Temple of Amun Mut Khonso. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what he discovered is that the ancient Egyptians were actually using aspects of nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were using animals to describe aspects of nature mm. is what they're doing. And, you know, it basically is kind of a scientific language because they're using that language to describe nature just as much as we today are using a different language to describe nature. Do you think, Edward, that we're kind of handicapped today? Bear with me on this one. Do you think we're handicapped today because of our, okay, for example, we're talking English now. Yes, it is very descriptive if you're elo eloquently able to put these long words together and describe some complex concept. But if you look back at ancient Egypt, these guys were using symbolic thought, like, you know, the use of animals to describe maybe the characteristics of a, you know, an event or something like that. And maybe using their right brain in one respect and left brain in one respect and therefore using this interplay between left brain and right brain and therefore more balanced where we're stuck in this left brain dominated world western civilization where it's all science technology one uh, you know language of like written language and you know we don't really use the expression of the right brain anymore do you think we're like handicapped today as opposed to the egyptians being more fluid there's no there's no question about it we are uh this is the whole idea behind behind science and there's an actual origin to it and there's a, there's an actual point in time to when, to when it actually started, uh, it, it, to go back in history about, about 600 years, 600 years ago, it was heresy to claim that the, that the planet Earth revolved around the sun. It was heresy to claim anything that was scientific if it opposed the church. Mm. Okay. So the way around this, the way to win over the people and prove their case, was science started doing experiments that were provable. And the, the way to do that was, was to be a reductionist, to observe and to run experiments and to reduce things to the least common denominator. Okay, that's how science began. And science has always maintained uh, that method of operation. It's always material reductionism. This is how you get to the bottom of things. And it's been, it's, it's been, it's been a long time. It's been 500 years. And really, we've finally gotten to the bottom of things. And that began with uh, a man by the name of Max Planck. Uh, late, late 19th century, early 19th century. Max Planck discovered the quantum, uh, the quantum of energy, which sure. Sure. which is the, the birth of quantum physics. Einstein took it a step further with his theory of relativity, but within just, just a decade or two, you have people like Erwin Schrodinger, uh, Niels Bohr, mm -hmm. Werner Heisenberg. These mm -hmm. men did, did the experiments and came to the conclusion that reality is not what we think it is. What we think of material reality, reality and these atoms is wrong. Okay, mm -hmm. the stuff really doesn't exist as we think it does. Mm -hmm. And this led to our day and age now of quantum physics because quantum physics gave birth to the science and technology we have today. All this cool stuff we have today, whether it's a computer or an iPhone or a smartphone or a smart car, cars, cars have all computers in them mm -hmm. this day and age. The internet, uh, all these cool toys and things that we have today are a direct result of quantum physics. Sure. And qu quantum physics has come to the point where it can't be reduced anymore. Yeah. We're done. We, we yeah. have to switch around and start using our right brain to balance our, our left plane, brain so we can, so we can keep going forward. I like to pull in uh, Dr. Michio Kaku at this point. In oh time. yeah, what a what a fascinating guy. 
Yeah, he's 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 probably the most well known physicist today. A great spokesperson too, Edward. I I like him it's, because it's, he's tr- he's tr- he's trying to bring the balance that you're talking about. Yes, he is. He he talks about civilization, and and he says that we are still at uh, a stage what he calls civilization zero, and that is we have not been able to overcome our differences and our problems and achieve a level of planetary power okay now he says we're getting close because we already have the communication system of civilization one we have the internet we have the computers and he claims that in order to truly get there to civilization one okay we need to find a way to make uh, energy abundant and cheap. Everything needs to become abundant and cheap. Only this will propel us mm-hmm. to an actual stage of civilization one. And I think it's right. So, Edward, you're saying with Michio Kaku, you know, that and the abundance of energy, um, it, it's, it's a necessity for us to raise the civilization. I kind of think sometimes that, you know, Mother Earth has given us abundance of energy and that. I may be a bit bold with this statement, but like the seven billion people that are on the planet, I think could could be sustained if it was uh, rationed out and di- um, proportionally uh, distributed and not held. And I'm talking about the gold reserves. I'm talking about the money, the food, and everything, and the water. Um, you know, I think we it would be hard to manage. I don't have a solution for that. How that would happen? But I think you know we are abundant on the earth. Um, it's certainly in food sources, and uh, there's no need for starvation at the very least. Okay, maybe not everybody would be wealthy, and not everybody would have everything they want. But I think we'd be able to, you know, have the basic necessities of clean water, food for everybody, and a reasonable uh, income. Line. I agree absolutely, totally, 100%. Uh, like you introduced me that I live here in Illinois. Uh, it's right smack dab in the middle of the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, the I live – I had mentioned that I live in, in the largest cornfield in the world because central Illinois is all cornfield and soybeans. Uh, wow. This state – well, the whole Midwest for that matter. What we produce here is corn and soybeans. And it's not for people to eat. It's not used for that. We have the richest ground in the world, and we don't really grow food for people. We grow food for animals and for byproducts. The soy is turned into soy oil and used in all kinds of applications for all kinds of processed food. The corn is is fed to cattle and hog that's later slaughtered for us to eat. We don't grow any vegetables. We, we don't grow any fruit. We don't grow none of that. So if we would start there, start at home and start growing fruits and vegetables and start spreading that technology all over the world, that could change the world. Sure. I, you know, I don't think we're ever going to calc- ca- conquer the galaxy because they're too busy conquering each other in a way. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, we, we live in a dominator society. And, mm-hmm. and, and really today, we have come so far with our technology and our economic sophistication that today it's all about the money. Yeah, yeah. It's a shame. and It's a shame. You know, you mentioned Schwaller de Lubas there. You know, I, I love Schwaller's work. Um, um, thanks, to, obviously, to John Anthony West. He's done a great um, uh, a great credit to Schwaller and bringing his work to the forefront. Um, a little bit difficult for some people to read. I quite like it actually. It's it's complex in some respect, but you know that's some of the best stuff is the complex stuff. <laughs> so, well, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it is. He's, he's he's you have to when when you read Schwaller to Lewis, you have to think about it yeah. because because but well, getting getting back to symbol, a topic we were discussing earlier. Sure. What Schwaller to Lewis is actually saying is that. We, as a humanity, as a planet, maybe as a galaxy for all we know, our life sustenance, okay, is based upon the nausible, the spiritual, the eternal, okay? And what the Lubitz is saying in his work on symbolism is how this non-physical entity of consciousness that we are, how that becomes material experience, how we see it as we are now. How that works is it moves through a layer of symbolism to become material. This is why symbolism is so important. 
This is why the ancients used that whole concept of symbolism in their structure of communication. It's because they understood that, and that's where they were coming from. Sure. You know, he was a genius swallower as well. And I don't think we would really have a true picture on ancient Egypt that wasn't for Swallow's work. That's that's that's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, he's he wrote probably twelve books in total, mm. and and each one of them is is absolutely mind blowing. Uh, he truly was way ahead of his time, and he was doing this back in the, in the nineteen nineteen forties and nineteen fifties. His last book uh, was published just before he died in nineteen sixty one. It was his great big two volume book, mm -hmm. The Temple of Man. Yeah, and 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 he was explaining that. That the temple of a moon in in ancient Thebes, modern day Luxor, it it, it was a college. It, it, this is what the temple was, mm. and and it was actually shaped like a human being. And where you entered at the feet and walked up through the femur, femur, then to the body and the head. <coughs> excuse me. Sure. They actually wrote. Did they actually created? the understanding and the teachings in the temple itself and the architecture itself along with murals so so their way of teaching was holistic as opposed to very fragmented and very reductionary as we do today mm -hmm. but the point is the egyptians got it right <laughs> They got it. You know, <laughs> exactly. Adam. You know, what I like with the Egyptian template is if I was given the Egyptian template and the template we have today for all the modern trappings of society and all the great little perks. If you're living in the Western world and you've got a, a semi comfortable lifestyle or whatever, you got food on your table every day, you can go to the supermarket and buy it. I would probably prefer the Egyptian temple. I, they, they seem to have got a better, a better overall perspective, balanced life. Well, it, 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 yeah, it, 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 it even, since we're on the topic, I'll go ahead and, 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 and go with that. Uh, the Egyptian temple, and this is not just in Thebes, this is any temple in any known anywhere throughout Egypt. The temple was its governing body. Okay. Everyone's familiar with Plato's Republic. Mm -hmm. Plato is probably his greatest work. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a book uh, called The Republic where he tried to analyze human nature, human behavior, and what was the best way to govern a society. And it's a big book, but his conclusion was that the best way to do this is you have to find the smartest and the most benign people there are and put them in charge. Because if you have warriors or businessmen in charge, they are corrupt and they're going to, they will run things to their advantage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Plato did not come up with that idea uh, by himself. Uh, even his own peers, this, this comes from, uh, Procles, the, uh, the philosopher later, a generation or two behind Plato, he made it, he made it known that Plato was laughed at by his peers because the people knew at the time Plato did not create Plato's Republic. He was actually, uh, borrowing from the ancient Egyptian system of government. And, and what Plato was saying to create these people to govern the land, he was saying, that you had to become enlightened to govern properly. This is where we get into the whole uh, cave allegory, where Plato's talking about we people are actually living in a cave and we're chained to a bench. We're watching shadows on the cave wall. And to understand reality as it really is, you have to break your chains, get up, turn around, see the fire behind you, see the man with the puppet making the shadows on the cave wall. And then after that, you have to go outside the cave and see the sunshine for the first time mm. to truly understand what reality is. And as these people who, are, who have achieved this level, they should be our governors of society. Wow. And it's, 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 he borrowed it from Egypt because if you see in Egypt, there's the famous, there's a famous uh, phrase of the ancient Egyptian mystery school. Yeah. Okay. No, no sure. one really knows what went on there, uh, but it, it was associated with the temple and the priests of the temple. Well, 
it's it's it's, it's kind of easy to see once you really do a big survey of ancient Egyptian culture mm-hmm. that the temple was not only the center of life, but it was the center of governance, and it was responsible for their three thousand year lifelong history, peaceful history for the most part. And that people, this is how I think it worked. I have to put a little conjecture in here because we don't know everything about the ancient Egyptian temple. But I think this is how it worked. No one got drafted into the temple. Okay, uh, People naturally, people have different passions. We're born, we grow up, we have different passions in life. Some people want to be a builder. Some people want to be a doctor. Some people want to be a philosopher. Uh, some people want to be an educator. Some people want to want to work as a farmer. Anyway, uh, the people that are very philosophical and and very oriented to the academic, they're attracted to the temple. Okay, mm-hmm. so they go there and they request the priest to be an initiate. Okay, if after interviewing and talking and whatever they do, then this person and it could be a male or female doesn't matter. This person then becomes an initiate, okay? And they get to live and study uh, with the temple priests, not for just four years, but for like 10 or 20 years, sometimes even 30 years. Uh, Pythagoras, uh, the great Greek philosopher, according to the history of of Pythagoras written by Iamblichus in the second century, Pythagoras spent 22 years studying with the Egyptians at the temple. So this is how their system worked, and you learned the necessities of life and the necessity of government in the temple, knowing what true reality is and what life is and how how sacred all life is. Then after a decade or two, you became a governor of of society, and this is how it worked. It's it's, it's actually very brilliant, and it's what's not happening today for the most part. Mm -hmm. Wow. Fascinating. This is all, what a wonderful discussion I'm having here, Edward. I love the way you bring in the, the importance of philosophy to look at where we're at today and to where we are in ancient times and to go into the Egyptian stuff and, you know, even to this deep antiquity of this mental scarring we got from the Ice Age onwards and, you know, all the problems that we have today. You know, they're, they're probably more prevalent than, than, than ever, you know, you know, and if we ever we are going to go into a golden age, Edward, we've got to face our problems, I guess, you know, and this is kind of why I do shows like this, Edward, is to take on books like this that address some key questions. This is what I love about your book, Return of the Golden Age. It, it looks at us too today. It's not just a history book. It's, it's looking at history, you know, where we were in the past, what was good, um, you know, some problems too. I mean, I think this mental scarring that you're talking about where, the scarcity of resources has driven us into this, you know, psychological state in a way, Edward. We, are, do you think we could ever break out of this state, this psychological state that we're in for, you know, this hoarding of resources? I think we're in the process of doing that right, right now. now. Yeah. Uh, the Internet has really changed everything. Oh, it's a beautiful uh, thing, isn't it? It's a beautiful yeah. thing, Edward. Yeah, I'm I'm 53 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so most of my life has been lived without the Internet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you know, uh, going back to, to my to my childhood and my high school days and, and early college days, I was a junior in college when the IBM PC came out. Wow. <laughs> okay. So, so so I've seen this 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 huge shift in society from from 35 years ago mm. to now, and it's all because of the technology mm. and the internet mm-hmm. and what really weighs on me hard what really hits my mind hard is that 30 years ago uh here in illinois we had three channels we had the national we had abc nbc and cbs Mm -hmm. that was our sole source of information Mm -hmm. What, what what whatever the program director for the news wanted to be on the news that's what we considered news and Mm -hmm. that's it Mm -hmm. okay well once the internet comes out 
in 93, 94. And those first five years, it was, it was really a golden age of the internet. Sure. Uh, I, I was into it. I was writing software for it. I was into browsing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had Mosaic, the very first web browser. And, and, and that first five years was a golden age just for us geeks. You know, <laughs> however, however, the world figured it out in the late nineties, about 98, 99. Yeah. And then all of a sudden commerce figured it out. We can make money on the internet. Yeah. Okay, th- then you have this internet explosion around 1999, 2000. Sure. And, and since then, everybody in the world is broadcasting themselves. Yeah. There's, a gaz- there, there's a gazillion news services to choose from. Mm. Uh, individuals have their own channels on YouTube. Sure. Uh, long story short, everyone is communicating with mm. everyone else figuring out what's going on. Politics is under attack. Religion is under attack. Exploitation, greed, and war is under attack. The bulk of humanity, the people, are starting to figure it out. And this is where people like me, Graham Hancock, Chris Dunn, Mm -hmm. Robert Robert Bouval, a whole bunch of other people come in. Basically what we're doing Okay, as mm-hmm. alternative historians, if you want to use that word, I really don't like that word, but sure. you know that's what's been been slapped on us. Uh, what we're doing is we're telling the academic system, look it, we've read your books, we've read your history, we don't buy it. Yeah. Okay? We have the resources now mm-hmm. to get our own answers for it's, ourselves, and, and guess yeah. what? We're going to do it. Yeah. In a way, Edward, it's like leveling the playing field. I mean, for, for a long time, these titans of, you know, documentary channels or publishers, you know, they, you know, it, it, you, you the level, anybody can get on the net now and speak to the masses, you know, and it's, it's, correct. it's changed us in terms of our infrastructure. Yeah, Edward, in a way, like, you know, the, the internet has really leveled the playing field. It's, it's changed the, the masses, the way they can interact with us. Like you say, you know, this, this infrastructure, initially information, then socially changing us, um, money, money, monetizing, you know, your products, everything, you know, commerce is just all done on the internet now. Even myself, Edward, I, I laugh. I, uh, last year, I, I've solely changed over to, I do everything on the internet now. I turned off the TV news channels because I get better news online. I get more realistic news. I get everything on YouTube from, you know, either every everything's just on YouTube for me now. Whether I want to watch the science program or news or, you know, you can get independent TV channels. Everything's on the net. It's how I communicate now it's with the world. And, and this is how we're doing the show today. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. And and I think, um, you know, if it, if it's embraced in the right way, it's going to shift our consciousness, whether we like it or not. I mean, people have been slow to to change with it, but that's the way it happens. We don't, whether you like it or not, it's going to change. And I think, you know, we have this self-organizing instinct, you know, and that's what happened with the Internet. It, it was put out there. It's self-organizing. Um, it comes in bursts of stages and, you know, it. it it's going to affect us socially, then that social change is going to affect our consciousness. It's, it, it's a step-by-step process. Um, I guess then, Edward, the coming golden age, you know, we got to stop the wars. we got to stop the abundance. You know, how how is that going to break free? Are we going to have to education and awareness? Is, is that the key, Edward? It is the key. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the key is that the people in general have to become enlightened. They have to truly understand the the spiritual, eternal nature of humanity. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Jesus, getting into the Bible a little bit here, mm-hmm. Jesus, Jesus actually got it correct. I'm not talking about Christian dogma. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about the, the philosophy that a man, that a supposed man named Jesus, uh, laid out 2,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have ancient documents from that time, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and basically, I, I mean, it's a really long story short, but Jesus said, you've got to love your neighbor. Unconditional love, in a way. Unconditionally, you've got to treat other people like you would want to be treated. 
Mm. Okay. And what he was really saying, and this is absolutely true. What he was really saying is that we, we people, we are all one thing. We are alive. The planet is alive. We're all one thing. We're not really separate. Mm -hmm. We're all one thing. And until the masses of people can get to that point to understand that we are one thing and it's in our own best interests to take care of ourselves, we won't be able to reach a golden age. But this whole movement, and I'm going to go ahead and call it a new age movement because that's the label that's been slapped on it. Yeah. Slapped on us. Uh, its origins go back uh, 60, 70, 80 years. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, and it's, it's, it's getting more powerful as time moves forward because people are able to share mm -hmm. their information on the web through YouTube, through chat rooms, through forums. Mm -hmm. And, and what we have to do, this is the most important part. There is a system in place. It's the hierarchical system in place where you have to grow up and get a job and pay for your own life on the planet. Uh, living here is not free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And until we find a way and, – and, and, and actually, just to stick on that topic for a little bit, this system, which, which is actually a corporate system. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean it's the it's, – it's the accumulation of wealth in, in, into small, small areas. Small numbers, and, a, yeah. and legally speaking, a corporation is a person. Okay, sure. it's treated it's treated in a court of law just like it's a real person. Uh, what's different than a real person is a corporation can keeps living forever as long as it's viable. Okay, that's the big difference. Until we can break away. From this accumulation of wealth in, in, in small, small corporate groups, we will be stuck in the system where we have to grow up and get a job and pay for our, our, our house, our food, our car, our insurance and fuel. Okay. That's what's holding us back. And right now that's very expensive. So we have to find, uh, uh, less expensive ways of, of energy and food and transportation that will free us up uh so there it becomes a question of technology and if you listen to some of the great physicists like michio kaku uh my son thomas is a physicist and i've talked to him about this at length mm -hmm. okay we have the technology to do it today mm -hmm. it's just okay? the will it's the will edward That's correct. It's you've got you've got a few people in some extraordinarily high places that they're living their own golden age right now, and they don't want things to change. Of course, yeah, they're okay. They're in their golden age. That's correct. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's just 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 think about it a minute. Let's go back to the very first kingdom, the Akkadian kingdom, mm. uh, some five thousand years ago. Okay, yeah. yeah. The king and his nobles, they got everything they wanted. Mm -hmm. And it's been like that ever since. What I'm saying here is in the last 5,000 years, nothing has changed but our technology. The system has been in place for a very, very long time. Okay? And it's, it's continuing on. And education and technology and then applying that education in, and technology into civilian life, that's the only way to get out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, some people say to me sometimes, you know, they, they would prefer a comment to come in and, and, you know, hit us again, whatever. So many people get wiped out and, you know, it would destroy the infrastructure and we could all start again. I'm like, well, no, because we're just going to go, we're going to go back to the same place. This is going to yeah. take another 10,000 years, Edward, you know. Yeah, now, we are there. Yeah. We're going to have to address the problems we're facing now. I know there's a small number of people at the top that are living in the golden age, Edward. However, I, I really do believe that education and awareness, because, you know, I've, I've evolved in my own small little lifetime, Edward. You know, I, I was locked in chasing money and chasing career. I, I did okay into my twenties and I, you know, I want to change for me and I want to change and I, and I became a bit of a better person to my comrades, work people and socially, you know, I started to think more philosophically, Edward. I, I, I changed my own philosophy, like through through my own desire. So I I know there's other people out there that haven't done that, 
However, you know, we can all be better to our fellow man. You know, that's not going to get too hippy dippy like, but you know, we can like, you know, it's like, it's an important key thing. Um, you know, and I think, like you say at the start of the book, you talk about George Orwell's 1984. Like, you know, I, I think we got to George Orwell's 1984. We looked at it and we're on a U-turn now, Edward. I think that's where we're at. I think we took a U-turn away from that because I think we've all seen that shoved into our face and it's not a nice thing, Edward, you know, and that's where we're heading. No. We're heading to that as a permanent facet of society. No, no and, and, and as I think about this, it's just, this just kind of popped into my head. Uh, it's, it's, it's Western society has, is, has actually been a double edged sword to itself because mm-hmm. Western society originally is very hierarchical, a very dominator, very expansionary, very, very exploitive, uh, a culture and civilization, mm. but when when uh, the colonists came here to America back in the 17th century, sure. and and they they were here for several hundred years before before they broke away from the British crown and became the United States of America. There's something very unique that they did with with our U.S. Constitution, and and when I first thought of this, uh, it was kind of mind blowing, but. The first three amendments in our Constitution, the, the first one is the right of free speech. Okay. The second one is the right of free worship. You can worship anything you want. And the third one is the right to own and bear arms. Mm. Well, these first two amendments in the Constitution is all about free thought. Sure. Okay. Free belief, free thought. And then the third one about 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 the right to, to own and bear arms, that is a check against a corrupt government. If the government gets so bad, America is armed to the teeth and can overthrow itself. Now, built into the Constitution is a peaceful revolution every two to four years because Congress is elected and so is the presidency. Sure. But the But the important thing is – the freedom of thought, and and that I think is what's being spread around the world in these past two hundred years is the freedom of thought, and now with the internet, now with the internet, mm-hmm. that whole freedom of thought has has been taken to a whole new level. Mm-hmm. Not all countries have the freedom of thought, too. Sure, yeah, it's not, yeah, exactly. There is countries out there that you know are trying to stop this out, too, Edward. Um. You know, I think that that would be the greatest threat that humanity faces is that they hit the kill switch and kill the internet, Edward. If they can kill yeah. it. I, I think that is actually one of the biggest threats to humanity because I think it has saved us in a way, Edward. And not to put too much importance on it, but it's given people a lease of hope that, number one, they can reach information at the finger of their tips. You know, many billion pages are on the internet. You can find anything. Anything within seconds now, you know. Anything you want within seconds. All you need is a computer terminal and access to the internet, and you have whatever you need. If it's there on the net, you'll find it pretty quick. And the kids these days, even even kids as small as three and four and five years old, they can they can operate a computer and and a smartphone uh, like nothing. It's it's incredible. Yeah, it's it's embedded into them now. Yeah, they're like sharper, smarter. They know to go and get the information on the net because they know it's there. They 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 know how to access it. Um, yeah, and I think that's beautiful that, you know, today kids are being taught the internet at a very early age, how to use it, you know, um, how to, you know, to, to get research projects now. And like I say, when I was in school, you know, we did a half an hour on the internet. We didn't even know what it was. We didn't even, it was still growing anyway. But nowadays it's, it's embedded in their culture at all levels. It's embedded in their culture at all levels. And that it's a, it's a U-turn. It's a swing, it's a swing point. Um, I guess just on a, on yourself then, Edward, um, I guess when I'm picking up on this, but when you look and you write books like this, The Return of the Golden Age, and you look at the past um, in a philosophical sense, do you learn about yourself? Do you learn about the world today? I guess that's why you wrote the book. Well, it's it's really I, I learn about myself just just as much as I learn about anything else. Uh, it's, I'd have to say it's, it's my own personal it's my own personal journey into the cosmos. Is what mm. it really is, mm-hmm. uh, because it, it, it's it's well. When I was a little boy, uh, going to grade school, and I actually totally forgot about all this. I was writing poems from parents. Wow! 
And, you know, got into junior high, got into high school. Uh, I'm a football player. I'm a baseball player. You know, you want to party. You want to meet up with girls. And there's this whole social cultural thing going on in junior high and high school. And I kind of got caught up in that, lost that, like, like most people do. And, uh, you know, I kind of woke myself up around my junior year and decided, you know, I better go to college. You know, I really don't want, want to work at the grocery store my entire life. So, so I decided to go to college. And uh, I took the aptitude test like all juniors do here. And an aptitude test is just to see what you're good at. And I remember my aptitude test coming back as uh, that I would excel in literary arts. And when I saw that, mm. I was kind of disgusted. I was like, what? Wow. I should go into the literary arts. How am I going to make any money and get a job with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so when I, when I went, when I went to college, I decided to go into business and become a, a, a business financial analyst. Wow. And that, then that's what I did for the first 10 years, uh, of, of, of my adult career. But while I was doing that, mm-hmm. I, I found out that this urge to write just wouldn't go away. Wouldn't go away. Yeah. It just wouldn't go away. So what, what I started to do in, in, the, in, in my first job uh, with a, a commercial real estate developer, I started writing video reviews for the company paper. Mm-hmm. And then in, in the summer of, of 1991, uh, I had watched the third Alien movie starring Sigourney Weaver. Mm-hmm. And I was really disappointed in it because I had read the book and the book really didn't match up with the movie at all. And it was supposed to. Well, you know, I was really uh, distressed by it. And me and my friend were talking about it. He's a big science fiction buff. And I said, you know what? I could write a better, I could, I, I could write a better movie than Alien 3. Mm-hmm. And he said, I dare you to. So I did. I spent the summer in 1991 uh, writing two novels. Really? Uh, the first one was called Alien Study. The second one was called Tomorrow's Cold War. I never did anything with them, never got a publisher, and he just forgot about it. But but that that three months of that summer, I was writing novels, and I had no idea why. Okay, so so uh, you know, then five years later, when you know I see Graham Hancock's uh, Quest for Lost Civilization. John Anthony West and Robert Shock's The Mystery of the Sphinx. That, that just turned me on to, to the history thing. Mm, and, mm. uh, and, uh, I, I just could not resist, uh, writing. I, I mean, this passion that I was born with. And I found out I was born with it because, oh, five years ago, I was with my mom on Mother's Day and we were going through all my old stuff. And I'm finding these poems that I wrote when I was like eight years old. Yeah. And I'm going, holy cow, oh, this is a journey. Rediscovering and, yourself in a way, Edward. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, and as I delve into writing more and more and delve into history more and more, uh, the truth of reality and the truth of who I am and what the world is starts to come out and it starts to come out through ancient philosophy and through science because I think there's I think true science okay that does not have an agenda will agree with ancient philosophy almost point for point you know yeah. and uh, and then uh, I lost a job at a bank it was a big banking merger takeover we all lost our jobs there it was a complete takeover I was 48 years old, and uh, my wife and I decided to, to move to Lincoln and start business. And that really hung me out to dry, because when 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 you throw away everything you you've done in your life, move somewhere else, create a business all by yourself, uh, it separates uh, soul from spirit. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I started meeting people, talking to people, running a business, and seeing life as it actually is. It is yeah. And, and when, when you talk to so many people on so many levels, you can start to get a benchmark of what's real and what's not real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, 
quite, quite extraordinarily how this happened, I don't know. But when we opened this business, I started dreaming uh, incredibly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And my dream life became very cogent uh, mm-hmm. to the point of actually being conscious while I was dreaming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that kind of totally woke me up, so to speak. Sure. I, I, I still remember probably the most important dream I've ever had. This was like three years ago. It started out as an ordinary dream. Me and my boys were in this uh, big boat of a, of a car, and we were traveling. And we were going to stop on this big white house on the hill to attend a party. It was, there was our friends there. And we went to the back, and there was a party in, in the backyard. Uh, it was just your normal normal cocktail party, people mingling, talking, and drinks in hands. There was a sofa uh, in front of a television, a big LCD television. And mm-hmm. I thought I'd just sit down and watch some TV for whatever, for whatever reason. Well, I did that, and then it started to sprinkle. And uh, I intuitively knew that the party was over. It's going to rain. We're going to have to leave. Mm-hmm. So before we left in the dream, uh, intuitively, I wanted to go freshen up. So I went to the bathroom. And when I stepped over the threshold of the bathroom, I became consciously aware of my own thought life, my own mind, and my own dream. And I had the ability to to deliberate with myself. And I'm standing in the bathroom doorway. I can see the toilet to the left at the end and the shower to the right. I looked down to my lower left and I could see the two, the double sinks of the bathroom. And I thought to myself, deliberating, Bathrooms have mirrors, don't they? And I said, yes, they do. Okay, turn around, look in the mirror, and see what you look like. And so I did that, and I saw myself in the mirror, uh, how I put it as I really am, how I really look in the eternal, spiritual, whatever word you want to slap on that, mm-hmm. uh, in the real world. And, and it just totally blew me away. And from that point forward, I've never perceived the world in the same way again. Wow. Wow. How fascinating. I would. And we're just out of time. Um, you know, you are really a prolific researcher, a historical researcher and philo- philosophical researcher. And it shows in the book. It really does, Edward. Um, Return of the Golden Age, Ancient History and the Key to Our Collective Future. You can tell that you are a prolific researcher because of the variety of authors that you research, the material, the topics that you cover. Um, you're very knowledgeable in the stuff too, Edward, when I'm talking to you. It's, it's a wonderful book. Uh, I urge the readers to get out there and uh, get a copy of it. Um, I'm looking forward to getting a copy of some of your other books as well. And I welcome you back to the show at some point, Edward, to talk about another book of yours. Thank you. I would I would love to be back. I am working on another book. Wow, you are. Uh, yeah, I, I am working on another book. It's kind of a it's kind of a continuation of Return of the Golden Age. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I, basically, I, I, there's a there there there's been a spiritual conspiracy going on for the last twelve thousand years, and the ancient Egyptians pinpointed it in the Nag Hammadi text mm-hmm. some uh, some two thousand years ago. Wow. And uh, I'll have a lot to say about that. Wow, that sounds really interesting. And, uh, you know, Edward, like, the good thing is, is it's, an, it's a unique book too, Edward. That's why I'm trying to promote that there for the readers, trying to urge them to get a copy because it's, you know, a lot of people concentrate on, you know, uh, ancient history and they, they concentrate on the technology or they concentrate on, you know, some of the mystery or whatever, you know, and, and, and yes, you do that too. But, you know, you also look in at, you know, the philosophical roots of all this, you know, and you have, and trying to give, give us some sort of a modern perspective on it. Bring some. Yeah, I'm bring, trying to bring back the, 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 the right half of the brain. It's, yeah. we've been so reductionist and so separated for so long. Mm. What I'm trying to do and trying to accomplish, I'm trying to look at all these different pieces of the puzzle. And, 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 and put them together in a, in a holistic manner mm. so we can see the big picture as it really is. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. I think, well, I think you've definitely achieved that, Edward. You really have. And they say, look, you know, hopefully we'll get you back on the show, not too distant future for another, uh, another book review. It's been a pleasure having you, Edward. And, uh, you know, we'll talk to you in a not too distant future, my friend. Thank you very much, James. I, I enjoyed being here a, a lot. I really did. Specs of nature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're using animals to describe aspects of nature mm. is what they're doing. And, you know, it 
basically is kind of a scientific language because they're using that language to describe nature just as much as we today are using a different language to describe nature. Do you think, Edward, that we're kind of handicapped today? Bear with me on this one now. Do you think we're handicapped today because of our... Okay, for example, we're talking English now. Yes, it is very descriptive if you're elo eloquently able to put these long words together and describe some complex concept. But if you look back at ancient Egypt, these guys were using symbolic thought, like, you know, the use of animals to describe maybe the characteristics of a you know, an event or something like that, and maybe using their right brain in one respect and left brain in one respect, and therefore using this interplay between left brain and right brain, and therefore more balanced, where we're stuck in this left brain dominated world, Western civilization, where it's all science, technology, one, uh, you know, language of like written language, and, you know, we don't really use the expression of the right brain anymore. Do you think we're like handicapped today as opposed to the Egyptians being more fluid? There's no, there's no question about it. We are. Uh, this is the whole idea behind, behind science, and there's an actual origin to it, and there's a, there's an actual point in time to when to when it actually started. Uh, it, it, to go back in history about about six hundred years, six hundred years ago, it was heresy to claim that the that the planet Earth revolved around the sun. It was heresy to claim anything. That was scientific if it opposed the church. Mm. Okay, so the way around this, the way to win over the people and prove it. Now, I'm not saying every single person was a Christian and went to church. What I'm saying is that our culture and the state of mind of the people was to look at belief patterns in a modern way. Then, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. So when they started looking at ancient Egypt, they automatically uh, superimposed their ideas of religion into the ancient past and came up with the concept that the ancient Egyptians had to be nature worshippers, animal worshippers, because all of their 200 gods had something to do with animals. Okay? And... That that nut was cracked pretty hard by a man by the name of René Chouard de Lubitz. Uh, he was a Frenchman, born in, in 1877. He mm -hmm. passed away in 1961. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he spent a full decade uh, in uh, in ancient Thebes, modern day Luxor. Mm -hmm. and, and then why he did so it was, was was actually just a situation at the times. He was living in France. And uh, in 1939, uh, the, the Second World War started, and it became very apparent to him that Germany was going to cause Europe a lot of problems. So he and his wife in 1939 left France and moved to Luxor. And there he hooked, he hooked up with an, 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 uh, an archaeology friend and decided to spend the next decade uh, trying to unravel what the ancient Egyptian culture was all about. And here I'm talking about the Temple of Amun, or to be more technical, the Temple of Amun Mut Khonso. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what he discovered is that the ancient Egyptians were actually using acid. People can find you on the Inner Traditions uh, publishing website, um, uh, as all the artists we do on the show. And uh, um, Ancient Mysteries International are doing a conference at Serpent Mound, is that correct? That's correct. At, at uh, Serpent Mound in Ohio, that'll be in June, and they're doing another one in August at uh, the Cahokia Mounds near Collinsville, Illinois. Wow! And you'll find that on Ancient Mysteries International. Uh, you've got, got a uh, wealth of people there. I think you've got Ross Hamilton, Gary David. Uh, Gary's been on the show. Great guy, Gary David. Uh, David David Hatcher Childress as well. So that's correct. He's going to be the keynote speaker at the Serpent Mound Conference. Wow, so that's June 21st, and uh, you know, if anybody wants to go along to that, we've got a big listener base in America, and get out there to, uh, what a beautiful setting, Serpent Mound, I've always wanted to go, I think it's a fascinating place. Um, you know, the uh, thing for me, Edward, is uh, obviously, uh, as you talk about in the book as well, the role of symbol and symbology and stuff, and this is a core part of us today, um, as well as it is in ancient times, right through. We've always had symbology. It's always been symbol and symbology. Let's talk a bit about that, Edward. Well, language is symbolism. 
plain and simple. Mm. Uh, so, so some people will think that we invented language so we could lie to each other, which seems to be the case this day. <laughs> but, but, but symbolism is the heart of any language, whether it's scientific or not. And when you look at, at ancient Egypt, the first look at, at ancient Egypt some 100 years ago, or maybe a little bit more than 100 years ago, well, we have to remember that at the late 19th century, early 20th century, Europe and America was still very Christian Bible oriented. Okay. Do you buy into Velikovsky's theories then? That is, I guess this is similar to Velikovsky's stuff? Yes, it is. Uh, Velikovsky was on the right track. Yeah. Uh, I don't really think that, that Venus was created out of Jupiter, that it was an explosion out of Jupiter that, mm -hmm. that made, made, made a planet. I don't, I just, I don't, I don't like that very much. Uh, how, however, are you still there? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here. Okay, I, I heard something in, in my headset that was strange. Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, but Venus is peculiar because Venus is supposed to be Earth's twin, right? But it's so hot on Venus. I believe the Russians landed a, a, uh, a, a ship there to, mm -hmm. to try and take some readings of, uh, I don't know, probably a decade or so ago. And the, the vehicle only lasted for about uh, three minutes because it's so hot on Venus uh, yeah. that, 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 that the spaceship just melted. So why Venus is so hot, no one really knows. Mm. So, so I think Velikovsky had the right ideal. I don't buy into all of his details, but he definitely had the right idea. Sure. Sure. You know, uh, Edward, we're just coming up to the top of the first hour um, and we'll continue on again. But I do want to mention uh, your conference. Uh, of course, it your case was science started doing experiments that were provable. And the, the way to do that was, was to be a reductionist, to observe and to run experiments and to reduce things to the least common denominator. Okay. That's how science began, and science has always maintained uh, that method of operation. It's always material reductionism. This is how you get to the bottom of things, and it's been it's, it's been it's been a long time. It's been five hundred years, and really, we've finally gotten to the bottom of things, and that began with uh, a man by the name of Max Planck, uh, late. Late 19th century, early 19th century, Max Planck discovered the quantum, uh, the quantum of energy, which, sure. Sure. which is the, the birth of quantum physics. Einstein took it a step further with his theory of relativity, but within just, just a decade or two, you have people like Erwin Schrodinger, uh, Niels Bohr, mm -hmm. Werner Heisenberg. These mm -hmm. men did, did the experiments and came to the conclusion that reality is not what we think it is. What we think of material reality, reality and these atoms is wrong. Okay, mm. the stuff really doesn't exist as we think it does. Mm. And this led to our day and age now of quantum physics because quantum physics gave birth to the science and technology we have today. All this cool stuff we have today, whether it's a computer or an iPhone, or a smartphone, or a smart car. Cars, cars have all computers in them, mm -hmm. this day and age. The internet, uh, all these cool toys and things that we have.